Now, without further ado, I am going to bring in uh, Andy and Chris from Kinfolk and Sistig, and they're going to be talking about the ghouls that lurk within your cluster and how we need to unmask them. So welcome, Andy and Chris. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Do you have a problem with ghouls lurking in your cluster? With poltergeists in your pods? Demons in your demon sets? Good news, my friend, you've come to the right place. I'm Andy Randall here representing the forces of darkness. <laughs> and with me today is... I'm the Angel Kranz and I'm here to share blessings over your clusters. Chances are, there's a rabid, fluffy rabbit already got into your cluster, waiting for the time to strike. Because as even William Shakespeare knew back in 1623, Kubernetes is not secure by default. For pesky little devils like me, this is a great opportunity for mischief, particularly around Halloween. This isn't the first time that Kubernetes has been under threats from the forces of evil and the heavenly gift that gave us Kubernetes has been haunted by ghouls for a number of years. As of course, as its popularity increases, so do the, to the complexity of attacks. Each vulnerability and exploit is, is a potential pivot point for lateral movement and digging deeper into the soul of your infrastructure. Something somewhere in your clusters is exposed. Are you confident that it's protected and isolated? Do you have confidence in every single workload that you're running right now in your clusters? So we, we want to have a look at the, the occult threats out there, the ghosts and ghouls that are just no longer scanning with bots for un unauthenticated management interfaces. We want to really analyze what's going on. So it starts with that initial access. Performing the rites of Ashkente is going to summon death himself into your cluster, but maybe it's better than publishing your credentials on GitHub um, or exposing your management interfaces. At the execution phase, while removing the head of, a head of a zombie is a great way to stop them in their tracks. It isn't going to stop the gas from executing commands in your containers once they've found a route in. And persistence, everyone knows that if you summon a poltergeist into your house, once it's, uh, once it's home, it, it's made its home, it's hard to get rid of it. But one that has invaded your cluster is going to be difficult to exercise. Privilege escalation is something that everyone wants to get to when they're attacking your cluster. And much like the invasion of the body snatchers possessing government, government bodies, once they're there, it's very difficult to get them out again. Um, defense evasion. Um, Walking, walking backwards is a great way of confusing your trackers. Uh, and so is clearing logs, purging events, deleting pods is a great way to, un, uh, to, un, to cover your tracks of a, of a malicious activity. The number of containers that die all the time, um, can you really, and, and they take down their logs and their events with them, can you really be sure that every single one of those container deaths is something you expect? Do you know exactly what happened when each of those died? And of course, credential access. This is a popular mis uh, misuse of, of, of artifacts, whether you're accidentally publishing them to, to GitHub or leaving them as credentials, leaving them as secrets on your cluster. Once someone's into your cluster, can you sh be sure that they haven't got access to other things that they shouldn't be having? Now, discovery happens a couple of times, sometimes at the start, but again, later on, once they've mapped out your infrastructure, they've got your credentials, they've got persistence, they're able to execute within there, they're now gonna map this out and work out where else do I want to go? And once they've got that mapping out, that's when they start doing lateral movement. So, you know, we know how quickly zombie bites, uh, zombie bites can affect the masses. And much like once your containers are infected and your Kubernetes cluster is infected, that's gonna not, it's not gonna just be the only place that's gonna replicate across your cluster. And finally, we all love a good witch burning and ritual sacrifice, but uh, uh, um, your malicious ghouls out there and demons, they're out there to destroy stuff. They're out there to steal your resources, steal your data, and make good with it. And evil types like me do use these techniques in the real world. Those do-gooders at Aqua Security try to thwart us with their honey trap, looking to catch ghoulish attackers in the act. 
based on their analysis of what we're actually up to, they found that 5% of the time we're trying to bring down your application with a denial of service attack. That's a lot of fun, of course. But as we know, money is the root of all evil. We love mining for Bitcoin because it's practically untraceable free money. I mean, can you blame us? <laughs> so that's what we're up to. How do we get in to haunt your cluster in the first place? Back in the good old days, we ghouls used to get into Kubernetes through the front door of exposed management interfaces. As those exploits became well known, people have got smart and closed off that vulnerability, forcing us to get more sophisticated, adopting lateral movement and privilege escalation techniques. Fortunately for us evil types, <laughs> <laughs> the workloads that people are deploying into their clusters are enabling these attacks. A recent Cystic survey found that more than half of images run as root. Probably many of them unnecessarily so, while 40% of images are pulled directly from public repositories, repositories, meaning they're more likely to have critical vulnerabilities. In fact, more than half of the images scanned had critical or high severity vulnerabilities. So what can you do to avoid these attacks? Well, <laughs> of course, I personally recommend nothing. <laughs> but if you do want to spoil my evil spirits fun, first and most importantly, you need to keep your operating system, your Kubernetes distro and application components up to date. If possible, automatically updating, for example, with an operating system like Flatcar Container Linux. Secondly, because patching won't always be possible, and won't address all vulnerabilities, you need to monitor what's going on in your cluster. Now, to understand how to do that, we have to delve deeper into the underworld of the Linux kernel. The system call is the Enochian language, the demons and other user space spirits you use to talk to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is the soul of your computer. It's like a medium conversing with the, with the undead. When we interface with the kernel, we have access to all the kernel's resources. The, sys the syscall is the spiritual medium that allows us to talk to the spirits within the kernel. But, but then why syscalls? Um, syscalls really have everything. They give us access to all things. They are like God, they are, they are uh, omnipotent, they're everywhere. Um, and uh, everything that needs access to some sort of compute resources leverages a syscall at some point, whether it's running Python, running curl, whether it's browsing the file system, writing to files, just reading a config file, um, or if it's making network connections to connect to other things in the etheric plane. All of, these all of these activities create and use system calls. System calls are the same language used across the entire stack, whether it's a host accessing resources at the kernel level, whether it's the OS itself exercising its demons, whether it's Kubernetes running a system call to run pods, connect to networks and present file systems, or of course, just applications running depend on system calls so they can haunt their users with Python, Go, Java-based applications, and many, many more. We evil spirits are pretty frightened by eBPF or extended Berkeley packet filter. It really does have supernatural powers. You know how when you write code as a regular user, it runs in user space. Well, BPF opens up Linux, so custom code can run in kernel space. These custom programs are compiled and run in a virtual machine, which first verifies the code to make sure it won't crash or lock up the kernel making it much safer than a kernel module or a device driver. The virtual machine code attaches into the kernel at specific hook points. For example, when a syscall is executed by a user space application and has access to a limited set of helper functions and data structures known as maps, which can be used to return data up to user space. Now, if you're not spooked by that high level description and want to dig into this whole topic deeper, there's a scarily easy to read and comprehensive site, ebpf.io, maintained by the Cilium folks. And it's got a ton of resources, so recommend you check that out. Um, but what you might be wondering at this point is why should you even care about this BPF thing? So for developers, eBPF helps you shine a light on tricky bugs or performance issues. It also enables blazing fast networking 
with highly customizable packet processing. And for folks operating clusters, it enables you to monitor what's going on and enforce security policies right within the kernel, ensuring very low overhead and making it harder for those ghoulish attackers like me to subvert. You know what? EBPF is hard. Um, the the uh, EBPF is used to, to access, uh, uh, sorry, it's hard to use directly. Um, it's a complicated language. It's, it exposes all those system calls. Um, I work for a company that leverages EBPF and system calls, and I don't even know half, well, more than half of them. Um, even with God by my side, I still can't understand all this stuff. Um, as they say, you don't have to be a mad scientist, but it really does help. Remember, Dr. Frankenstein spent nearly half a century studying mad science before he finally gave life to his monster. Unlike the Necronomicon, EBPF takes careful study and practice before you can resurrect your first demon. So let's introduce a couple of tools that really, really help you out. Fortunately, we've got some mad scientists from Sistig and Kinfolk that have helped create some open source tools that are really going to help you out. First of all, I'm going to talk and show you Falco. Um, Falco is kind of operationalizing this stuff, turning, turning the eBPF, uh, um, the system calls, into a policy-based language that you can keep running and keep analyzing for this unsavory activity that's going on within your clusters. It's much more designed for operations and DevOps teams who are actually running the platforms to continually analyze these things. On the flip side to that, Inspector Gadget, it's really like a Swiss army knife for, for developers, for debugging things. When you Once you've detected something, maybe with Falco, you want to then go in and really drill into the details of that, understand why that happened, why this is repeatedly happening. And of course, if you've got the ability to recreate these demons, uh, maybe through some seance, then you can use uh, uh, Inspector Gadget to bolt onto that and, and just dig into that in much more detail. So you can see that both Falco and Inspector Gadget are very, very complementary, um, uh, really, really help you out with here. So let's start with Falco. Falco is it's kind of like the syscall wizard. Um, it, it's, it's the magician that sits there and gives you this bridge between the, the, the kernel space or purgatory, the underworld, where all the, the un, uh, underlying kernel processes are running, which you don't normally have access to. And it presents this up into the user space or the land of the living. We do this via a, a couple of combinations from, as, as the, the devil himself said earlier, uh, we've got these eBPF maps that allow us to, to extend what's going on uh, within that kernel space into user space. We use the holy books of libescap and libinspect um, to give us a, a nice friendly interface to these. So then we can, in, can interface into that. And the Falco wizard gives us the ability to write simple to read uh, uh, YAML definitions that really allow you to jump in there and create these rules to detect when these low level system calls happen without you having to understand syscalls. So you don't need to be possessed by the devil himself in order to understand this stuff. You've got a nice simple language. So if we can switch across. I'm gonna share. There we go. So here, uh, to just to, to lay out the, the the land here, I got Falco running down the bottom, or I'm going to have Falco running down the bottom. Um, I am running this on uh, uh, on Vagrants, so there will be a couple of errors coming up. Just a lazy angel, you know what? I've got some resources lying around. I I, I live in the cloud, but I've got act this stuff. So I'm going to run Falco here. I'm running it with eBPF enabled, obviously. Um, uh, while that while that runs up, it's like I said, it's going to generate a couple of errors. Um, of course, I'm running this on Flatcar Linux because I'm not daft. I want a nice, safe operating environment to run my containers, and I would run this in the Kubernetes cluster again if I wasn't a lazy angel. So as you can see here, we, we bring this up. Falco presents uh, a, a web service interface. This is where we can ingest other data sources. But for now, we've got it up and running. Um, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a Docker from um, uh, Madhu uh, Akula, uh, sorry if I butchered your name. This is a really, really great, uh, a great tool that that is a container that's got lots and lots of, uh, of different hacking tools built in together. What I'm going to do is run uh, a, a Linus, which is a, a kind of a scanning tool. What you'll see straight away is that Falco has detected that we've got a shell within a container. So Falco here with the defaults, nothing, nothing customized here. Uh, this is just out of the box. We can see that Falco has detected a shell within a container. First of all, that's the first hit. We don't really want that sort of activity happening. 
now if I'm going to run a, I'm going to run a full system audit here, uh, just to see what sort of activity that goes on. And you can see straight away, the first thing that Linux does is clear up its logs from the last time it ran. We can see here now it's launching network tools, uh, doing things like dig, doing things like nmap. These are things that we don't uh, um, really want going on with these things. Um, I'm just going to see if I can make this a little bit larger to do. So you can see all this activity going on. Um, so you can see all these things again out of the box. This is Falco. Uh, um, the the built-in tools here are looking for suspicious activity. We can see things that we don't want your containers to do. You know what? You don't want your users uh, um, connecting into your containers. You don't want your users running things like nmap. Um, what else we got here? Looking at etc shadow. Um, you know we don't want this sort of activity. This is activity that's definitely unwanted within your cluster. So that's going to keep running. I'm going to I'm going to terminate that because it goes on and on and on. Um, and then when I log out of that, uh, what I'm going to very very quickly do as well. Um, now this is again my compute probably isn't powerful enough for this, but I'm going to run. But uh, uh, by all means, steal this address and you'll start generating some bitcoins for me in in nice hash. Um, but this is uh, Alex Ellis's demo, and we can see straight away again. Falco is is able to even though a connection is failing here. Um, because I've got other firewalls in place uh, to stop my kids doing this sort of activity. You can see here that 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 Falco is jumping in there and detecting this this uh, possible mining connections because we're detecting this stratum address being in use. Um, this is generally what most miners do. There's not much computing power out there that will generate coins on its own. So all of these crypto uh, crypto miners are generating to a pool so they can pull the resources of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of abused systems. So you can see very, very simply, just with the default rules here, we're able to get some some sensible some sensible feedback from Falco, and of course, from here you can absolutely go in and customize that. So I'm unfortunately going to handle back over to the devil. I don't often like handing back to the devil um, with his ne nefarious activities. Well, thank you very much, there, Chris. Um, so let's talk about Inspector Gadget. Uh, switch gears here uh, as. Um, our angelic friend uh, says it's a Swiss army knife of different gadgets, all implemented with BPF. Um, the, uh, the nice thing is that it's uh, integrated with Kubernetes. So it's a uh, kubectl extension. So you can just do kubectl gadget and whichever of the gadgets you want to, um, want to run. And uh, you can select which pods you uh, want to apply the gadget to across the whole cluster just using uh, label selectors in a uh, way that's familiar to you as a Kubernetes user. Now, what are the uh, ghost-busting gadgets that Inspector Gadget gives us? Well, um, quite a few, actually. The first is a capabilities um, monitoring tool. So uh, you can run uh, an application with all capabilities enabled and check which ones it's actually using and then define your pod security policies to narrow down the scope of what's allowed. Um, then the uh, group three um, snooping tools, which trace um, new file openings, new processes, and new uh, IP v4, v6 bind system calls. Um, there's a TCP tracer, which traces TCP connects, accepts, and close, and TCP top, which shows the actual traffic, um, which is happening in, in the pod. Um, really nice one, which we've used in some uh, real customer scenarios where they had uh, performance issues in a cluster that they just didn't know how to get to the bottom of uh, is profile and allow, allows you to get really fine grained um, processor um, profiling on, on your applications. Trace loop, I love it's, we call it a flight data recorder. Um, this is a, a great tool. It, it keeps track of all the syscalls in a ring buffer uh, for the selected pods. If one of those pods crashes, you can go back because those, um, uh, those calls are uh, saved and you can see what was being done right up to the point that it crashed. So that's a, that's a really nice uh, tool. And then the last one, uh, Network Policy Advisor. Um, you know, I know uh, from my work previously with Calico that uh, network policies is a, a great way to enforce security in a cluster. The problem is it's really hard to define what those network policies should be. So Network Policy Advisor listens to the network traffic uh, and then deduces from that some recommended policies that you could apply to your to your pods and you can review those and decide to apply them or not. So we're going to look at just a couple of these uh, in a demo right now. So I am going to share my terminal. 
and let's have a, let's have a look at this. So first of all, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a look at uh, exec snoop. So kubectl gadget exec snoop. That's the way we just uh, access the exec snoop gadget. In this case, I'm gonna put it into the apply it into the default namespace, and I'm gonna use a selector where I have run equals cooking. So um, at the moment, there's uh, nothing happening in there. So if I go down here, I'm going to do a command, which is not a great um, thing that you should be doing in a live cluster, but we are going to do it uh, here as to demonstrate. So we're going to create just a uh, regular pod. This isn't a deployment or anything, and we're going to, it's going to be shell command doing that classic uh, anti-pattern curl pipe to pipe to bash. Let's see if we can do that. Slash chef slash install dot sh and pipe to bash. So let's go with go on that. And depending on how fast my internet is uh, feeling at this particular moment of the day. Okay, we're starting to see some um, some uh, commands execu ex executed there in the top. So you can see it's those are all the commands up to the point where it's doing a curl. Um, and now it's downloading and it's Python doing all the potentially nasty things. And we can see up on the um, in the top pane there uh, what's what's actually happening. Great. So that's uh, that is. That is that demo, and and I will I will terminate the gadget there. So now um, we're going to uh, do a demo the network policy monitor, and we're going to use um, a demo application from Google that uh, is a store um, and has a, a bunch of microservices um, that all connect to one another. So so if I do. Um, so I can see, okay, so I have no pods in my demo namespace. Um, so I'm gonna do network network policy is my gadget. It has a couple of sub commands. The one I'm gonna use right now is uh, monitor. And I'm gonna send that to network trace.log. So specify my output file. Uh, now down here, I'm going to uh, apply this um, uh, the Google microservices demo, which is contained in this microservices demo manifests.yaml. We'll give that a few seconds just for those pods to start up. Um, and uh, let's have a have a look, see what's okay. So some of them are running, some of them are still creating. Load generator always crashes until the others are, are created. But okay, we've probably we've probably got enough uh, network events now that have been happening that if we go back to um, my gadget here um, and I can uh, look at that log. So this is a not very human friendly uh, log of all of the network traffic that's that's been happening. Um, but fortunately, I have a, a great command with. Uh, with the network policy um, gadget called report. So this is a different subcommand. And now I'm going to give that an input of the network trace.log that I just had. And I'm going to output that to network policy.yaml. So that uh, that runs through network policy.yaml. And now you can see. Uh, it's created a really nicely formatted network policy. And for example, I can see it suggesting that um, the app cart service should allow um, egress traffic to the Redis cart, um, or the checkout service should allow ingress from the, uh, from the front end on port 5050. So I can review those, and if I'm, if I'm happy with those, apply them to my, uh, to my cluster. Um, so, I'm now going to go back to here, hopefully. So that was my demo of, um, uh, of uh, Inspector Gadget. Uh, if, if those demos have uh, wet your appetite, then here are some links to find out more. 
And do check out that um, Falco site, go.sysdig.com slash cloudstreet.html. Uh, get a haunted mystery box from Sysdig. Uh, Chris put this in. I have no idea what it is, and I wonder what it could be. Something ghoulish, I hope. So thank you for your attention. And I'd like to point out, in the 30 minutes we've been talking, my evil ghouls have produced another three blocks worth about $40,000. Some of those might have even been on your cluster. So happy ghoul hunting and happy Halloween from us. Thank you. Brilliant, very good, uh, Andrew and uh, Chris. Love the heaven and the hell. And now we've got the questions. Mark is to my left. He's got his Marks and Spencer's beer, Andy. You'll be happy to hear that. Oh, <laughs> high quality stuff. We want to know how jealous you are on a scale of one to ten. Oh, uh, three. Living in living in Germany, where apparently the beer is not that good. All right, what have we got here? Um, so a couple of facetious questions. One of them is, how am I just learning about Falco today? Uh, a lot of big thank yous and supportive messages in there. Uh, let's have a look at the Q&A. A, a very strange message. One person has sent a message saying, I love the devil and I love the angel even more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? So I don't know what that's about. You want to you see, what, see what's going on there? A bit of matchmaking. Uh, <laughs> but most of it is just messages of support. I think, you know, the question we always ask now is if people want to learn more about this, obviously, if they got excited by your talk, um, where, would you, where would you point them to? You mean the, uh, the penultimate slide here? which was where to go. So uh, falco.org for Falco. And Inspector Gadget uh, is, it's a little bit of a techie thing. So it's literally just the GitHub, uh, github.com slash kinfolk slash inspector dash gadget. Or it's one of our, it's one of our pinned um, repos if you just go to github.com slash kinfolk, K-I-N-V-O-L-K. And I'm sure you can find um, you both in the Slack, in the Brella, and of course on Twitter. Of course. Yep. We, I, I personally or think... just pray. <laughs> or just we, pray yeah, Only for you, Chris, not, not for Andy. <laughs> we think you might, you, you've got shoeing lads for the competition, for the costume competition. Ah, actually, yeah. you know, do just pray. Please don't apply any security tools into your clusters. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how we run container solutions, Andy. <laughs> that and a little bit of social media strategy. Cool. That's it. Thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Brilliant, Chris. Brilliant, Andy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.